We're live. It's not exciting. They kind of do that with those talk shows. You know, they got everybody all excited about things, then they start everything, and everyone's like, hey. <laughs> okay. You mouth someone who just logged in is like, what are they doing? Hopefully you have a copy of the bulletin, a copy of the sermon notes, and let me see if I remembered my Lord's Supper in my pocket today. Yes, I did. And if you didn't grab your handy-dandy uh, communion supplies, make sure you do that. And as always, the offering box is in back, and uh, if you haven't made your contribution, do that before George takes the box, or see George, and make sure that your contribution is added. As we already mentioned today, there is a business meeting at 5 o'clock. It's here at the building instead of by Zoom. We already know that one person is in Hawaii, and I was thinking about making things available for them. I haven't worked out the details on that, or if he wants to call in. That would be dandy, isn't that great? I'm in Hawaii. Don't worry about me. I'll call. No. It's nice to be able to travel to Hawaii. Yeah, it's business, but it's Business. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, let's see. Also, I uh, want to make you aware of Commission Sunday, as is our tradition here at the Orange Vale Congregation. And of course, there's some more information on the back page about that. We also want to make you aware if you weren't, uh, Annie S.A.'s mom passed away this past week. That's, you know, JD's wife. And she had been on our prayer list, but uh, her mom did pass away. So, uh, prayers for Annie and the family. And uh, Charlotte's daughter-in-law, Stacy. she had been diagnosed with cancer, as I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, she's been in our bulletin. Surgery was supposed to happen. It was going to be postponed. As far as I know, it's happening tomorrow. Is that not correct? So let's keep Charlotte in our prayers. Also, Stacy and uh, the family. And of course, this is quote-unquote holiday time. And uh, there are a lot of people you know, doing various things and traveling as it may be, but uh, just uh, you know, keep everyone in prayer. Keep our congregation in prayer. Anything else for announcements or the uh, prayer list? Okay, well let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll get into things. Father God, we wanna thank you again for being our God and for loving us and for blessing us. And Father, as we think about those on our prayer list and those needs that we have, we do ask that you'll be with those who have lost loved ones, be with Danny, be with others who are struggling at this time. We're mindful of Stacy and her surgery tomorrow. We pray that you'll give her a spirit of peace and calm, that you'll be with Charlotte as she does her best to encourage her. Be with us all as we do our best to encourage one another. Father, help us to always stay true to your word and follow the path that you've laid out before us. Father, we pray for your blessings and your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. So we're reading for today, sitting in the book of Psalms. I'm reading Psalm 51 and verses 1 through 4 from the International Version. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right who speak and justify when you judge.
to is I'd be in trouble if I get up here half prepared, have to go back and get myself reset. It ain't easy to do that. I'm going to drop my glasses. Just make these better for myself. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So I'm going to read a little something I, I was seeing this morning and, and on, on Facebook. And, and uh, it just, I was reading this thing, and hey, you know, that's kind of important. So I thought, well, I'll just kind of add it to the job at hand here. So we cannot save ourselves from sin, sickness, pain, depression, lack, confusion, or any other horrible thing you can think of. Only the blood of Jesus saves us from it all. He suffered to make our future nothing but good. He is a wonderful self-sacrificing Savior. He gave his own blood for us. So that's why I'm up here, is so we can give thanks for that wonderful gift that he gave oh so many years ago for each and every one of us. Those out there in YouTube land and all of us wonderful people that come here every Sunday to give thanks and honor his memory. So let us give thanks for the body that he sacrificed for us at this time. <clears throat> Lord God, thank you for everything that you have done for us, especially this gift of your son and the body that was so broken Oh, so many years ago, it is with a humble heart that we take this communion. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let's also remember the gift of, of the blood. Lord God, once again, thank you for your son and the shedding of his blood, which was shed in our, <clears throat> for our lives and for, so that we can have that opportunity to always come with the knowledge that even though we've sinned, in which we will always sin, we know that the sins have been washed away through the lifeblood of your son. In Christ's name we pray. And as uh, was mentioned earlier, there is a communion box in the back. Uh, if anyone has a need to, or it's not even really a need, it's just a, it's an overwashing sometimes to give back for all of what God gives us, to uh, give back a little something to this beautiful, wonderful congregation here in Orangeville, and, and to help keep it flourishing and, and moving forward. So let's give thanks all that the Lord does in our everyday lives. Lord God, thank you once again for everything we have. The food on our tables, the, ho the homes that we live in, the clothes on our back, the jobs we have. Everything that we have in our lives comes through you. And we thank you for this beautiful home and it's with a humble heart that we give back just a little of ourselves to this beautiful establishment. It is in yours and your son's name we pray.
making sure I'm on. <laughs> ah, well, hello again. Seems like I was here just a minute ago. There it was. There it was. It is really good to see everyone out assembled together. Um, you know, we're all facing various struggles, whether it's our congregation or it's just personal. Uh, the economy is a bit of a challenge that we're facing. I know this. I discovered that I don't get a whole lot of mail because election's done and my mailbox has been empty. <laughs> anyway, so I got some questions about that, but I've got all kinds of questions. There are questions about all sorts of things. It seems like we've got more questions than answers when it comes to things. Questions like, how old was the average 18 year old in 1942? You know? Oh, oh. Or where is the Great Wall of China? <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> or questions like, <laughs> what are those pyramid-shaped things called in Egypt? Um, there are a lot of questions like that that people ask. I kind of remember when Jay Leno used to do that, you know, sort of the man on the street asked questions like that, and people were like, I don't know. Anyway. But hopefully we know the answer to those questions. You know, those are easily answered questions. The answers in the question, really, you know? And you answered them in your head, or you made a snarky remark like my, you know, Scott does. Scott and I think too much like a thing, but anyway. Um, <laughs> in many ways, the Apostle Paul does the same thing with the three questions that we're going to take a look at today from Romans chapter three. And that's because Paul also asked three questions with obvious answers that his readers should have answered in their heads. Or they gave a snarky answer. Anyway, but just in case they didn't get the right answer, he gives them the right answer. So let's start things off with the first question that's talked about, and that is the advantage of being a Jew. Here's what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. He asks, what advantage then is there in being a Jew or the value uh, there is in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. Well, okay. All right, so what's happening here? is that the Jews were essentially objecting to Paul's teaching about universal judgment that we talked about last week, remember? Because in their minds, you know, in the Jews' minds, and those Christians that were Jews, it destroyed their special standing with God. And that's because the Jews felt in, you know, it was some justification, right? that because they were God's chosen people, that they had a special relationship with God. Just they had started to think that it was a relationship that would shield them from God's judgment. Now, while it is true that the Jews were God's chosen people, that truth doesn't negate the reality of their disobedience and subsequent judgment from God. And so, anticipating their objections to what Paul told them in the last chapter about circumcision and their Jewishness, Jewishness, Jewish, yeah, Jewishness, he rhetorically asks, if we're sinners just like the Gentiles and subject to judgment, then why bother being Jewish or being circumcised? And while we might think that Paul would answer that question, none, there is no advantage. That's not what he says here. Instead, he tells them much in every way. For example, the Jews were entrusted with the very words of God. I mean, think about that blessing. The Jews were the one people out of all the peoples on the earth that God, that God overtly and clearly and comprehensively revealed himself and his will. That makes you a special people. Now, the flip side of that advantage that every firstborn child in the family with multiple children knows is that more is expected of them because they knew better, right? They knew what God was like and what he wanted. And so the privilege of having God's law doesn't absolve you from following it. It actually means that you have a responsibility to follow it. 
and to help others follow it too. But instead of learning and following and leading, the Jews argued and debated and obscured. And so while having the law and circumcision could have been a great advantage for the Jews, they wasted it. And how that applies to you and me, hopefully, should be clear. Because we have the word of God. We have the knowledge of the salvation through Jesus Christ. And because we have that knowledge, if we choose to do nothing with it, then we've squandered what God has blessed us with. We're not supposed to sit on it and ignore it and obscure it and hide it away. We need to share it. We need to live it. The Jews also had the advantage of being faithful. Of being faithful. Again, back in our text, this time in verses 3 and 4, Paul rhetorically asks, again, not expecting an answer, right? What if some did not have faith? Will their lack, lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true, and every man a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Now, the question that's being posed is, if the Jews were unfaithful to God, would God be unfaithful to them? In other words, the Jews figured that since they were unfaithful to God, that, you know, they might as well give up on God because, you know, he's going to give up on them. And while it's true that the Jews hadn't been faithful to God as, well, they could have been, we can look back through the scriptures and see all that. And it's also true that God's wrath is universal. And it's also true that the Jews had become a source of blasphemy rather than blessing in God's name, as we talked about some last week. God's faithfulness is not dependent upon our faithfulness. Thank God. God will always be faithful to his promises, even when we're not. God will always be faithful to his covenant, to his people. And a part of God's faithfulness is his promise to punish disobedience. Think about it. In order for God to be just and holy, God will always remain faithful and righteous. And because God's promises include blessings for obedience and punishment for disobedience, He's going to keep his promises. It's important for us to keep our promises. We understand that as parents, you know, if you tell a child, if you do this and this, you'll be rewarded. But then if you don't do this and this, or you don't do, then you're going to be punished. If you just give the reward and not the punishment, what does that tell the child? I can do whatever I want. You're not going to punish me. God's not like that. God keeps his promises, both with the blessings and the punishment. And that's why it's important for us to understand the, the ultimate standard of righteousness is not what the government tells us. It's not what the school boards tell us. It's not even what our conscience or our feelings tell us. God's holiness and righteousness is the standard for us to strive for. That said, another part of God's faithfulness is his promise to forgive. And to get that point across, Paul wants us to remember what happened with David and Bathsheba after David's terrible, now there's more than one sin, <clears throat> we'll just say sins, with Bathsheba. And so he uh, quotes for us from Psalm 51, which is really a beautiful psalm. And that's a psalm that Jesse read from today. <clears throat> And David lets us know in that psalm that yes, he did sin. And yes, God did judge him. And punishment was coming. But after David confessed his sin, God also forgave him. And he even made some promises to David. Proving that God's grace is greater than man's sin. In other words, even if everyone in the world breaks their promises, God will never break his promises. And even if 
everyone in the world turns out to be a liar. God will always be true to his word. So there is an advantage to being a Jew and an advantage to being faithful. And again, that applies to you and me as Christians too, right? There's always an advantage to being faithful. God is faithful and true. He will keep his promises. There's also an advantage to being righteous. Continuing with our text, this time uh, picking up in verse 5. Paul continues, But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath upon us? I am using a human argument. He puts a little parenthetical there to explain it. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's faithfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say as we're being slanderously reported as saying, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil, that good may result. Their condemnation is deserved. Now, what Paul has done for us here is he imagines that the Jewish objectors are still not satisfied with his answers and want to argue that it's unfair that God is condemning them for acts of, for sinful acts. Because those sinful acts actually seem to enhance God's glory. And they create a logical argument for that, you know? In other words, someone might say, hey, Paul, you know, you just got through saying that David's sin gave God a chance to demonstrate both his justice and his grace. Well, if David hadn't sinned like he did, then God would never have had a chance to judge him and to forgive him. So in a sense, David was helping God out by sinning. And if that's the case, whenever I sin, then I'm helping out God too. But if my sin helps God out, then how can he judge me for being a sinner? Talk about rationalizing away your sins. You know? The logic here says that, well, I need to sin so that God can forgive me. So that God can do his, his part to show his love and grace. I'm helping out by sinning. But that's silly, right? But the church in Rome must have had a problem with understanding that line of thinking and the fact that it was wrong. As a matter of fact, Paul brings up this problem again later on in Romans chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2 when he writes, What shall I say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Clearly they had a problem with this idea. Well, if I sin, I'm helping God out. Okay. No. <laughs> the message of God is clear, right? If you don't, you don't sin so that God can show his grace and forgiveness, God forbid, sin is always sinful. There's no such thing as a good sin. But when we do sin, if we have Christ, then we can be forgiven. In other words, sin is the reason Jesus has had to come to earth and suffer and die on the cross. And so every time we sin, when you think about it seriously, it's like helping up. It's like we're helping to put Jesus on the cross. But their thinking in Romans chapter 3 is that sometimes good comes about from sin. But just because something good might come out of someone's sin doesn't make sin good. I mean, you can look back in David and Bathsheba and say, well, King Solomon probably wouldn't have come about if it wasn't for David doing what he did with Bathsheba. That doesn't make it right. The fact that God can bring good things out of bad choices doesn't turn stupidity into wisdom. That should be a bumper sticker. I like that. Bad choices doesn't turn stupidity into wisdom. Get on Etsy, make it so. The ends don't justify the means, okay? There's no advantage to being sinful. But there is an advantage to being righteous. 
There's also an advantage to trusting in God. You say, okay, who are the Jews to trust in our text? Well, that seems pretty obvious, right? That's a rhetorical question. Or that's a question you should know the answer to easily, right? More to the point, though, who are we to trust? And again, you should know the answer to that question. Where is our faith? You know, well, if I were to ask, you know, some questions like the Apostle Paul did in our text, maybe the first one would be, what about the faithfulness of God? You know, of course, rhetorically, rhetorically speaking, again, God is faithful. So, what about it? Well, while the Jews may have misunderstood the nature of God's faithfulness, they were right to believe that He's going to do whatever He promised to do. And you and me can depend upon God's faithfulness too, because God will carry out to the letter every promise that He has ever made. But it's important to remember that not every promise in the Bible is for you and me. What I mean is there are many specific promises in the Bible that are made to specific groups or specific groups of people. They are not for everyone. For example, God promised to give to Abraham a lot of land and a lot of offspring in Genesis chapter 12. Well, he eventually got that, but that's not a promise for you and me, okay? <laughs> you know? If you want a lot of children and a lot of land, go talk to God about it, all right? God also promised to give King Hezekiah 15 more years of life when he was sick and about to die. And you can read about that in a couple of places. One of them is Isaiah chapter 38. And God gave him 15 more years, right? But that doesn't mean he's going to give you and me 15 more years. Of course, there are lots of great promises that God does make for you and me. Like the promise that if we seek his kingdom, we will find it. Or the promise that as a Christian, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will forgive us if we do ask, you see. And the greatest promise of them all, related to those two, the promise of eternal life found in Jesus Christ. So what about the faithfulness of God? Simply put, God is faithful 100%. All right? Second, what about who we can trust? Well, think back to our text today, right? The tendency was to think that the covenant that the Jews had made with God somehow made them secure from threats of judgment. But that's not completely true, right? Because if you break the covenant, then you fall under God's judgment. That's a problem with some Christian groups today. They think, well, as long as I'm a part of the new covenant of Christ, I can do whatever I want, and I'm good. Well, no, it's not true, okay? The Jews learned the lesson the hard way, and Christians need to learn that too. Think about it. Under the new covenant of Christ, Christians are secure from God's judgment. You will face it, but you've got Christ as your mediator, right? Because in Christ we have the forgiveness of sins and the promise of heaven, but we need to be careful that that truth doesn't give us a false sense of eternal security, especially when it's open to abuse. Because you, know, you can kind of think, well, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I can just kind of skip out on doing some things that I know that God wants me to do. You know, whether it's giving or whether it's attending services or sharing our faith, you know, or just trying to live a, a faithful life. Again, rationally not rationalizing away our sins like they were doing. Of course, in Christianity, we know that if we do repent and ask God for forgiveness, that we are cleansed of our sins and the covenant is, is restored. But a Christian who constantly sins the same sins over and over again that turns around and promises God that they won't do it again over and over again and that they're sorry they need forgiveness, you know, there's a problem. There's a problem there. There's a problem. God knows if you are sincere, okay, and if you are sincerely struggling. If you are sincerely struggling, God understands that. But if you're just kind of paying lip service, God understands that too. Like we were talking about in our Hebrews class this past Wednesday night, we need to grow up and mature in Christ, right? And that happens when we not only know God's word, but we live out God's word. 
Sure, God loves us and we can trust him to forgive us through Christ, but being a Christian doesn't give us a license to sin. Our faith and obedience go hand in hand. Our faith and works go hand in hand. Over and over again, we read about how we are to live by the spirit and not by the sinful nature or the flesh. You know, do things that our flesh desires. And how about how we, you know, and how we live our lives, of course, is, is directly connected to how much we trust God and his word. It really is. Think about it again. If the word of God teaches us that the promise of eternal glory is for those who are truly God's. While at the same time maintaining that eternal glory is contingent upon a life of obedience and faithfulness. And that isn't contradictory. That's just the way it is. God loves us and we glorify him by our life. God is pleased when we walk with him and serve him wholeheartedly. And he's glorified by that. On the other hand, when we do the opposite, or like we talked about last week, God can be blasphemed, you know, for the way we act in the name of Christ if we're not living the way we're supposed to. So what about who we can trust? <clears throat> well, we can definitely trust in God. And we can trust him Again, because he keeps his promises. So, many, 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 many questions. And thankfully, God has given us answers to the most important questions of life. Questions like, who am I? Why am I here? Where are we going? God answers those questions telling us that, hey, we're all sinners in need of a Savior. God also has given us Jesus to save us. God also tells us that we're here to serve him and to glorify him. And we do that again by loving God and loving others. That includes service and doing good deeds and living our lives for Christ. We have a purpose. We are God's. We live for him and we'll be with him. We know where we're going when we choose the path of life laid out for us by Jesus Christ. The path that God has provided. We should also know where we're going when we reject that path. If there's anyone who has the need to answer those three questions in their life today, then know this, it comes through Jesus Christ. It comes from becoming a Christian, from learning and growing in God's word. And we become a Christian by making the choice to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and confessing him as our Lord and Savior, we make the commitment to him, to the new covenant, by being immersed in the watery grave for the forgiveness of our sins. And when we come up out of the water, well, we're cleansed of our sins. We're born again to live in newness of life, to live for Christ until he comes back again, or we go to be with him. For those who are watching online today, if we can help you out in any way, we want to invite you to contact us, and we'll see what we can do. The rest of us, as always, you know, the encouragement, if you have a need to share today, is to come as we stand and sing the song that was selected.
Again, it's really good to see everyone out today. It's a chilly but lovely sunny morning today. I'll actually, I love this kind of weather. Autumn has always been my favorite weather, as long as it's not too squishy when you walk around. <laughs> uh, but I do like the autumn. Uh, don't forget we have a wonderful time of fellowship afterwards in the back and this evening there is a meeting at 5 o'clock here at the building and uh, so uh, please uh, make the plans accordingly to uh, attend that. Let's go ahead and have a, a word of prayer. Most Holy Father, again, dear God, we want to thank you for blessing us with this day. We want to thank you for Jesus and the hope that we have in him. And Father, we know that you will keep your promises and so we live our lives in such a way that will be pleasing to you. Bless us and guide us. Bless our fellowship. Bless us as we follow and strive to do your will here. In Jesus' name.